Here we are on the Eddie Mata Show. I can't believe who I have. This guy's been in baseball for decades. He's been with the Dodgers organization. He's still with the Dodgers organization. He's with Sports LA. He's an analyst. He's a professor. He's a hockey scout. Might as well call you Slash. Please welcome Ned Coletti in the house, baby. Look at you. Hey, Eddie. Good to see you, my friend. You know, Ned, you made the biggest trade of a lifetime. I can't believe this. You actually traded an empty can of Pepsi for a pretzel. How did you <laughs> convince that kid to do that? Please, please explain that. <laughs> That's not exactly. Uh, it, I traded a Pepsi bottle. Oh, a for bottle. Depo- okay. For a deposit. The deposit was two cents. Uh huh. I got a little age on you here, and uh, for two cents you could get a pretzel. So I used to bring my my uh, my mom or dad's empty Pepsi bottle into Alan Joe's Delicatessen in Franklin Park, Illinois, and and exchange it for a small pretzel. There you go, right there, Alan Joe's. So that was your spot when you used to hang out and just go. And you know what I love about Alan Joe's? You actually met a Hall of Famer. What's his name? Ron Santo. Yeah. Ron Santo. I grew up in an Italian neighborhood in Franklin Park and nowhere near Wrigley Field. Probably a good 45 minutes to an hour down side streets, down Addison Street, and then a few others uh, to get there. But uh, Ronnie used to stop in there and buy prosciutto. And uh, the guys from Alan Joe's would call me because he would call from the clubhouse and no cell phones back then. You know, it was either carrier pigeon or, <laughs> or landline, you know, and uh, and he'd call and uh, say, hey, I'm going to stop by. And, and they'd call me and, you know, I'd uh, ride my bike over there. And I, I get, I've known I knew Ronnie from about the time I was nine or 10 years old mm-hmm. until he passed away probably 10 years ago now. And um, when he became a broadcaster for the Cubs, I was still working for Chicago then. Uh, as a baseball operations executive. And so our friendship continued from the uh, time I was about 10 years old and until Ronnie passed, unfortunately. Mm. You know what I love about your family is that Monday nights, like Wednesday night will be pizza night. Friday, no, Wednesday night will be spaghetti night. Friday will be pizza night. You know, I mean, you guys, you, your mom and dad and and brother, you guys were really tight, huh? Like you grew up in a blue collar neighborhood and you guys didn't really have that much money. No, we, uh, my parents were married in, in 1951 and, um, they, they were low of each other's life. They ended up moving into a, uh, a garage and, uh, and that's where they lived for really the first, probably the first 10 years of their marriage. And when you think about divorce rate and marriages and how tough they are in this year, I think about it we're living in a garage for a decade. I'm not sure how many of those marriages would have lasted, but I came around about halfway through and uh, we moved into a little town of Franklin Park, bought a, my dad bought a four room house, not a four bedroom house, a four room house, a little bit less than 900 square feet. And uh, that's how we grew up. And we, uh, we, we didn't have a whole lot, but we thought we had everything. My brother and I, our parents were, were strong people, good people, helping. They would always help a neighbor. They'd always go out of their way to help people. And uh, they worked tirelessly in, in what they did. And, uh, you know, I didn't grow up with a lot of entitlement. I grew up with really no entitlement. But I grew up with great parents that taught me the realities of life and taught me uh, to be good, to be gracious, to be kind, and to be helpful to people and uh, to be a blessing to somebody every day if you get that chance. You know, your when your, parent, when your father would go to Alan Joe's, the deli, and there will be an index card of people that owe people money. And your dad, you know, he had to pay them back. But they would scratch it off when he did pay it back. But they trusted your father, right? That's how it was? Yeah, it was a, it was a neighborhood spot. And there were a lot of people in the same condition we were in. And uh, my dad would get paid on Fridays. Yeah, he worked in a, in a factory that made cardboard boxes. My dad could, could fix any type of machine. And, uh, and so obviously we had a washer and dryer that lasted 30 years, a stove that lasted 30 years. Everything lasted forever because we couldn't afford to, to replace it. But uh, typically we'd be out of money on Wednesday. And uh, it's before credit cards or if there were credit cards, my dad never owned one. And uh, going to Alan Joe's and we'd be short, short of cash for a couple of days. And 
So they had this, this index card box underneath the cash register. We had our own own card with our name on it, made right down, you know, $2.50 or, or whatever it is that we purchased that would, would put us on the card. And then my dad, uh, there was no direct deposit back then. You know, he right. got paid, got a hard check and, and went to uh, went to the local bank, cashed it. And his first stop was Alan Joe's to settle his debt. You know, he paid eight thousand five that eight thousand five hundred dollars for the house, eighty five hundred dollars. Mortgage was seventy dollars a month, and that was that was that was tough. That was a tough nut to crack at that point. You know, your dad loved to fix things, and what was crazy was, um, you know, you guys would travel to your grandma's and down in Florida, and one time you guys got stuck in Tennessee. <laughs> it was a storm. <laughs> And uh, ordinary family will go to a motel. Your dad's like, "We're staying inside the car. Simple as that. Yeah. We're sleeping here, right?" Yeah, it was uh, it was one of those uh, those trips that we were we were hoping for good weather and and didn't have it. And um, we knew leaving Chicago that day that we were going to try and drive as long as we could drive, and ended up in in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and ended up with uh, a massive thunderstorm. And so, uh, you know, dark, probably midnight, pulling over on the side of a road and, uh, you know, slept there, woke up when the sun came up and continued on. But we were right at the edge of Lookout Mountain, which is uh, obviously a big part of the, that region and uh, not too far from going over the edge. We didn't know it at the time when we shut the car down, but we were close to going over the edge. And then years later, ironically, as life can go sometimes, our double-A team, when I was a GM at the Dodgers, was in Chattanooga, Tennessee for a while. And so I would run into Chattanooga two or three times a season to see the guys, see the players. And I'd you know, see Lookout Mountain there in the distance. And I'd come, <laughs> come a long way since Lookout Mountain when we didn't have enough enough money to have a hotel room and I ended up sleeping on the side of the road. <laughs> Ned, you, uh, listen, you grew up like, like, literally, you had nothing, man. And, you know, when you were wearing uh, sneakers and then, uh, uh, you know... Uh, when it came, like, you know, was the soles were going down on you, you know, getting thinner, you would put a cardboard in there just to say, all right, I can't afford new sneakers, so I'm going to put a cardboard in there, right? It was survival. I mean, we had to do what we had to do. We didn't even think, think twice of it, you know? And, yeah, after a while, your shoes would, would wear through the bottom of it. We lived in, obviously, an area with bad weather, a lot of snow in Chicago, a lot of cold weather. And so, you know, we'd walk to school. I'm not going to tell you one of those stories where you walk to school – 20 miles through a driving snowstorm every day, but we walked to school, walked to high school, and and um, you know we had a we, we didn't want to you know your feet are cold to begin with you start to get them wet you really got an issue so we would just put a little piece of cardboard in the bottom of them and continue on you know we didn't think anything of it we were just trying to get through the day and have a good day and and figure out how we were gonna uh, you know get get to a point better than our parents and our parents you know were were gung ho to try and get us to a point better than they had, yeah. you know. My dad died a young guy. My dad died at 51 years old. Uh, he got sick with lung cancer at 49, died at 51. My mom had never driven a car. We only had one car in the family. And it was, when you think about, uh, you know, today's society, that somebody would be 51 years old and, and never drive a car, probably a little bit unusual, but uh, never really had the chance. So as my, uh, my dad past we we had to, my brother and i had to figure out a, a whole lot of stuff for our mom too because she was she was really starting at the beginning of, of a, a huge change in her life and i can remember when my dad was dying his you know, his fear was a little bit of death but his fear was really of knowing that he had uh, probably left my mom his love of his life unprepared for what was coming because she had well we didn't have a whole lot financially she um you know, her job was to be a mom, to be a wife, a mom, uh, a cook, uh, the housekeeper, uh, the boss, the organizer. And, and that's how my parents decided that they were going to do it, that, hey, well, well we're going to struggle financially. We're not going to we're not going to not be there for our kids. And I have a younger brother, six years, six years younger, that uh, works for the Chicago Bears for 35 years on, on the radio broadcast. And so, you know, we we just we just figured out how to make things work. And whatever that was, we just had to figure it out. You know what I love about your mom was that she used to play catch in the front of the house with you guys. 
and um, she would keep when you guys would watch the well listen to the Cubs game. She would put out a scorecard for you, and you guys would analyze the game and you know break it down what happened. I mean that that's adorable, man. I, I love hearing stories like that. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, my dad, as I said, was a factory worker. So by the time he got home, he was pretty tired. So, you know, he did play catch with us and taught us baseball. But my mom continued it. Mm-hmm. And there were many days that we'd end up playing catch with our mom in the front yard. You know, kind of think about it now it might be kind of a weird a weird deal. But, it, you know, it was really uh, what we did. And she did. She did keep score. Um you know, not in a scorebook. We didn't have money for a scorebook. She just took a piece oh. of paper. Oh, okay. Wrote all, wrote all the lineups and... and and kept score for, you know, a lot of Cub games, but really the World Series. Back then, World Series was all daytime. So I was at school, a little transistor radio sometimes, but you really couldn't see it. So you'd race home to watch the end of a World Series. I remember, you know, the Cardinals in Detroit in 68, and Gibson pitching great, and Detroit rallying there. Um, you know, you remember things like that. And then she had it all written down and could bring you up to date, you know, on, on what went on. And, uh, it was, you know, my parents, again, they they, uh, they fueled a lot of our life with um, integrity and just genuine things that they that they taught us, um, including to, to work hard and to and to give to others. My mom didn't have to do that. Mm-hmm. She didn't have to keep score. She didn't have to play catch. But, you know, she knew that her sons love baseball and that they that they may get something out of it. You know? Ned, it was simple, Ned, simple life. Yeah. Ned, you took the. Uh, all right, so you used to go, you know, there was day games back then, the Cubs, before 86. So you would take a train and two buses, get to the bleachers by, like, 10 a.m. W- w- tell me your story about that. Like, w- what exactly would you do? I mean, you would come early to the ballpark, huh? Well, I I, I loved the sport, and I loved the Cubs growing up, and I had the blessing to work there for a long time before I went on to San Francisco and L.A., but... I got to be about 14 years old, and the Cubs started to get to have a pretty decent team. It was 1968, uh, and they finally started to to be competitive inside the National League. It was just one league at that point in time. It was just a 10-team league. There was no the, – the winner of that league ended up winning the pennant and going on to play a World Series. There's no DCS, wild card, LCS. Right. None of that stuff was around. But uh, I take the 805. From uh, the Milwaukee, the Milwaukee Road 805, from the Franklin Park Station, Mannheim Station, and took it down into the city, probably about eight or nine miles, uh, to Narragansett Street. Wait for a bus, get off the train, wait for a bus, take a bus over to Addison Street, wait for another bus, take the bus down to Wrigley Field. It used to take about an hour and a half to get there. Then you sit and wait for the bleachers to open, and the bleachers would open at 10:15, 10:30. No real set time. I mean, they opened them when they when they felt like opening them, but it was always early. And um, so I would sit in the left center field bleachers at Wrigley Field, first row as far over the center field as I could because that's where I learned how you can really watch a game because you had the entire game in front of you. And you see you see um, the field, you see a lot of different things that um, uh, you, know, you need to you need to know if you want to watch the game and really know the game. You see pitching, you can you can see a curveball, you can see a slider, you can see a changeup. You can learn all these things. It's like watching a game today yeah. from the center field camera. But uh, I did it every day. And I would go out and I'd watch BP. And I got to know some players, including Santo, wow. and, um, who I knew a little bit. And so you could even engage in conversation with him at 10, 30, 11 o'clock in the morning, maybe before BP started. And you could ask him a question. And you'd see different things. I would go to maybe 40, 45 games a season. That way, because again, there were no lights at Wrigley Field, so it was all day game. And some of my buddies I grew up with, you know, they loved, they liked the game. They didn't love the game. They liked the game. And so when I go on Tuesday, and I'd say, "Hey, I'm going to go back on Wednesday," they look at me like I was crazy. Like, you know, you should be doing this once a month, not every day. But uh, I didn't. And my dad, you know, the most money I ever got to do it on any given day was three dollars. And there were some days I, I didn't have my dad didn't have three dollars to give me. But three dollars would get you the train. Would get two buses there, a bus coming back, uh, a ticket for sixty-five for sixty cents, seventy-five cents, or a dollar. Think about those prices today. Yeah. And then on the way home. And some days when I, you know, only had a buck and a half to do the entire thing, I knew I didn't have enough money to get the bus ride to the end of the line at, at Addison and Cumberland. 
I'd have to sneak on the bus. You know, I'd do that once in a while. You got to do what you got to do, right? I mean, it, it's not hurting anybody. <laughs> live anywhere near Wrigley, so. <laughs> but it was a great period of time to grow up and to learn the game. You know, and I've been passionate about the game since I was a kid. I played, I played uh, baseball, I played soccer, I played ice hockey. Um, baseball was always my favorite and probably hockey second. But uh, I could never get enough of it. And um, I would go as often as I could to the tune of 40, 45 times. I'd come home, take the train home. My dad would pick me up at the end of the, the bus line and, and many times with a uniform in the back seat. And I'd change into uniform and, and go play in the city leagues of Franklin Park. And, um, and that's what we did. And, and I've been blessed that I've been so magnificently blessed in my life that um, uh, and when I was 15, 16 years old, people say, so what do you want to do? I said, well, you know, I, I'd love to be a, a dad one day. And maybe uh, if I was blessed to have children, send my kids to college. And I'd like to have a, uh, like to pay a mortgage and not rent. Right. And as, as uh, life has unfolded and the blessings that I've had, you know, I have, I have, both. I have two children that have master's degrees. I have, you know, places where I, you know, I have mortgages and don't rent and made a living and for 40 some years watching baseball. You know what? And, you know, I respect about your father so much. There was a time that, you know, Chicago winter times, he would um, he would have to start his car around 2 a.m. or 3 a.m. So it could work well. So then he could go to work. And yep. and you and you learned a lot from that because, you know, he had to put food on the table for you guys. And that I think you got that work ethic from your dad. Am I correct? No doubt. They, um, you know, my dad got paid by the hour. And if he didn't go to work, he didn't get paid. And we were already running out of money on Wednesday. You know, if he decided he was going to not feel like going into work for two days, we were done. Mm -hmm. We might have been, you know, run out of the house or whatever. So, you know, it was a very, very working family. And uh, in the wintertime in Chicago, you know, it's, it's nasty. And we never had a garage. You know, they got married and in a garage. Then they moved into a house that didn't have a garage. So the car sat outside. And my dad had to be, at this point, he was working for Motorola out in Schaumburg, which is a western suburb, probably 15, 15 miles, 10, 15 miles away from Franklin Park. Mm -hmm. And he'd go to sleep at 8 o'clock at night, at a winter, and get up at 2 o'clock and go outside and start the car up to make sure it would start. Because if you left that car from 6 o'clock at night when you shut it off until 6 o'clock the next morning and you had an old battery, there's a good chance that thing's not start. Right. And then you're stuck. And, uh, you know, you're not, you know, don't have cabs or, you you know, Uber or Lyft or none of that stuff. So <laughs> that. And so, you know, he he get up in the middle of the night and go out and start the car. And for those that, you know, watching that grew up in northern climates like that, you know, you don't just start the car up and then shut it off. Right. You got to let it run for a little while. Yeah. Make sure it warms up and that you get the, everything, you know, going. And you could drive it if you need. It. And then he shut it off after 15 minutes. Come back in and sleep another couple hours. This was every day. This was every day. Just plugs all of the night. You know, tuning up his own car, changing the oil on the street. You know, going underneath the car. You know, there's places to do that today. You know, you got places you can just drive in and they'll do it for you. But he didn't have the money for it, nor did, the, nor did there was any places that would do it. So he'd save money and he'd figure out how to do everything. And, and he taught me a lot about life. He, he didn't have the patience to teach me how to fix everything. <laughs> Ned, when you met your wife, Gail, and you brought her to your home for the first time, she said everything was miniature, including your kitty cat. Talk to me about that. Yeah, well, again, we lived in a house that was not even 900 square feet. Oh. And if you, you know, there's probably some offices people are, are working out of that are bigger than 900 square feet. Um, but that was the house. And so the, every, every room was tiny. And uh, the kitchen, the stove was a big stove. The stove, you know, was four little, four little burners, like all jammed together. Everything was compact. The whole house was compact, and you know we're we're not a uh, a tall family, you know we're like five eight to five two between myself and my, my 
me at 5'8", my mom at 5'2", you know. So everything was tiny, and uh, we've always had cats, and so, you know, we happened to have a kitten at that point in time, I think, and the, the cat, too, was, was miniature. But it's, you know, it was okay. It's It was okay. So now you got a job in Philadelphia. You moved to Philadelphia with your wife. You actually, you know, you bought a house too. You were writing for the Philadelphia, I'm, I'm guessing the journal it's called, for the Flyers? Yes. yes. And then what happened? Well, it was one of the toughest times of, of my life. Um, certainly the toughest at that stage. In, um, in August of 1980, I get a job at the Philadelphia Journal. I went to school to become a sports writer, and I wrote sports in Chicago and a couple newspapers. And then I had a chance to go to Philadelphia and cover the Flyers. Mm -hmm. So in August of 1980, I'm uh, I'm leaving uh, for Philly, and I go to see my parents. And uh, my dad comes in a car, and uh, as we're ready to go, and he says, uh, "I just want you to know I'm really proud of you." Now at this stage in my life, I'm probably I don't know 26, 27 years old. And I knew my dad was proud of my brother and I, but he wasn't the kind of guy that would express that a lot. Um, it was a good man, expressed love, and you, you knew you were loved, but you didn't really know how we felt about your career type of thing. And he, he, got, he put, I'll never forget, he put his hand on my, on my arm, it my, was like on the, on the windowsill of the car, and said, I'm really proud of you. And I was like, taken aback by that. And I and I drove off and I and I told uh, I told my wife I said uh, kind of bothers me what my dad said and she said it was beautiful what he said I says but the look in his eye told me that that something might be going on you know so we drive to Philly a couple of days go by and um, my mom calls me and she says uh, your dad has uh, your dad's gotten sick jeez and, uh, and she says. Um, I think he has pneumonia, but he's going to the doctor tomorrow, and we'll find out. So I get a call the next day, and she says that your dad's got lung cancer, and um, he's going to have to have one half, one side of his lungs removed. Um, you know, we didn't have uh, access to uh, in Chicago like a Northwestern Memorial Hospital or uh, Rush Presbyterian or Cedar Sinai, and in LA, we, we weren't the kind of people that had access to anything like that. So um, I had just started covering the Flyers. I was in training camp in Portland, Maine, and um, I had to get home. And so I, I left camp for about four days and uh, just started this job. So a little bit nervous about that. Um, but the journal understood and they were, they were good people. And they said, yeah, you know, take care of your family. This thing will be here when you get back. So I flew home. My brother was in college. I was the first in my family to go to college. I'm the seven of eight on my dad's side and the third of three on my mom's side. So um, I had the blessing to go to college, and my, my brother was the second of the Fleddies to go. So it was important he stay in school. And uh, I came home, and, and my dad had surgery. And uh, it was a really, really rugged time. So I get back to Philly, and uh, my wife and I decide, you know, my dad's not going to live very long. Uh, doctors said that he would probably live, there's probably a 10% um, a chance he would live five years. Oh. Either number's really that good. Hmm. So we decide to start a family. So uh, I, uh, my wife becomes pregnant in, in February of 81, and um, uh, my dad is getting sicker. I decide that, uh, as I told you, when I was 15, 16 years old, I wanted to have a mortgage and not rent. And uh, we were living in a little apartment in, in southwest Philly. And uh, I went out and I bought a duplex for about $40,000. Duplex is where you share the wall with the neighbor. Yeah. And um, interest rates then, you know, we all, you know, anybody who's bought a house, you know, the interest rate deal, they were like 18% back. And so, um, but I did it. I did it. Um, it was probably not my best decision, but um, I wanted my, I didn't, we didn't know if it was a boy or a girl. We didn't, you know, they didn't have testing and not testing we would, would look into to figure out the gender at a time and um, just decided we would, we would make the best of it. I was making about 19,000. My wife was making about 11,000. 
a legal secretary um, living in Philly. And her income stopped. She was going to become a mom. And so we were going to make it on my 19. So we bought this duplex in Lansdowne. And um, about six weeks go by, and the newspaper folds. And so now we have no income. I've got a mortgage at 18%. I've made one mortgage payment. I've only got 29 years and 11 months left to pay. I'm almost done, right? Wow. I'm almost done. I got only 359 <laughs> more payments to go. Exactly. And so um, I'm out. I'm out of work uh, to no fault of my own. The newspaper business was starting to crumble and uh, it folded. And then the Philadelphia Bulletin folded. So we went from four daily newspapers in Philly to two within weeks. So you had a glut of journalists trying to find work. And um, fortunately, uh, Bob Ibach, who had worked at the journal before me, had been hired as the Cubs public relations director and the director of publications. And uh, he kind of knew a little bit about what I was up against with my dad and kind of knew a little bit. I certainly knew that the paper had folded and uh, knew I was up against it a little bit. And Dallas Green had become the GM of the, of the Cubs that October, and they were changing the front office around. And uh, the slogan that they were using was building a new tradition. And so Bob called me and he says, hey, we have two jobs here. And uh, they're both, they both pay 13000 um, You know, I know you're in a tough spot. If you want to come here and interview for one, um, you know, we'd be happy to do that. Um, I can't guarantee anything, but we'll try, you know. And so I thought about it, and I thought 13000 you know, I think I did the math, and I, I really wasn't going to be able to afford much more than my mortgage. And I'd be living in a city without, you know, yeah. you know a house. So all those things, um, you know, kind of added up. I told my wife, you know, I don't think I could do this. I'm taking a $6,000 cut in pay. And uh, she was always better at math than me. And says, you know, right now uh, you're getting a thirteen thousand dollar raise if you get this job because you ain't got a job. Right. <laughs> you're at zero. One thing leads to another, and I I call uh, Bob and I say, could I talk to Dallas Green for a minute? And he says, uh, well, yeah, you know, we've about fifty people applying for both jobs. I won't ask him about money because that may rule you out. I said, just need him for a minute, you know. And he says, all right, but don't, and I said, just, you know, just give me 60 seconds. And because I had to figure out a way to get the job, right? And I had to figure out a way to support my family. And as I teach at Pepperdine University, you know, you got to be different. Competition for, for work is so difficult, so tough, not going to be any easier in the months ahead. What do you bring that nobody else will bring? I didn't necessarily have an education that was going to stun people. I hadn't played professional baseball. Um, I didn't have a whole lot that I was going to just sit there and have my resume speak for it. Right. So, um, Bob me up in and, uh, Wait, say that, say that. Say that again, because the wind took over just now. Say that again. Bob, Bob hooks me up with Dallas for a minute, uh -huh. and I start talking to Dallas, and I say, "I'd like you to consider something." Uh, and he says, "Don't ask me about money." I said, "Well, I just need sixty seconds. I need you, I need you to think about something." Um, I said, um, I'd like you to consider paying me $15,000 a year if this works out, plus 1000 to move me back home. And he stops me. And he said, we're paying $13,000 for this job, either job. And um, we have so many people trying to get this job, these jobs. You know, we don't have to pay anybody anything over 13000 And I thought that I told you, don't about the money. I says, you did. I said, but I wanted to consider something. And I asked you for 60 seconds and I'm not done yet. Right. So he says, all right, finish. And uh, I said, so I would like you to consider 15,000 plus a thousand to move me home. And um, I want to interview for both jobs because I can do both jobs and I'll do both jobs for 15,000. And it kind of caught him by surprise a little bit. And he said, why don't you come in tomorrow? We'll talk. And uh, that's how my baseball career started. I got $15,000. I made myself different. I, uh, I didn't have the playing background of being a major league player, professional player. 
I wasn't educated at a, an Ivy League school or a, a school of great reputation. Um, I had a bachelor's degree you know, from Northern Illinois University, good school, but certainly not a Northwestern or an Illinois or a University of Missouri for a journalism degree. Um, so I made myself different by saying, you know what, I'll do both jobs. Yeah. And so, you know, he did the math, I did the math. He's going to pay 26000 for two jobs plus benefits for two people. He's going to pay 15000 plus 1000 to move back. He's going to pay 10000 less plus have insurance for one less. And all the raises going forward would be for one person, not two. Right. So that's how I started my career. And uh, so you've been I, you've been with the organization for twelve years, but then you got the phone call from Larry Himes. And when you get a phone call, it kind of scares you a little bit, right? It's like, uh oh, what did I do wrong? Or something like that. Is that how you guys feel? Yeah. Well, you know, you kind of know. You know, I I didn't have uh, I didn't have a lot of communication with Larry. Larry wasn't. Uh, in my opinion, a very communicative type guy. And, uh, you know, many times when a new GM comes in, I had worked for Dallas, I had worked for Jimmy Fry, uh, who sadly just passed away this, this past January, uh, in Dallas just a couple years ago. Um, I worked for Larry, and, and Larry had his own guys in mind. He fired almost everybody in baseball ops early on. And then, um, and then, um, I think he was beginning the third year of a three-year deal. He was, and he called me a couple of days after Christmas and told me to come in. Uh, Larry, I think, was living in Arizona at the time, so that he would be in Chicago a couple of days after Christmas. Told me he had business on his mind, probably my business, right? You know, <laughs> and um, so I went down to Wrigley Field and. Uh, he told me he wasn't comfortable with having me there and that he needed to make a change. I didn't have a contract, and the Tribune Company were kind enough to me after they got back from, uh, they owned the Cubs at the time, after they got back from their, their Christmas holidays, uh, or Hanukkah holidays, to, um, to call me in and ask me what had happened. And I really didn't know what had happened, except that I didn't have a job. So they ended up paying me for most of that year until I could get settled with the Giants. And uh, this was also a very difficult time in baseball because you had a uh, strike. You had the 1990, this happened at the end of 93, the 94 season ended halfway through. No World Series that year, the game on strike. So I was put out there when most hiring was done because most hiring is done before Christmas. I didn't find out until three days after Christmas. So the hiring cycle for that season was over. And then the, the strike or the lot hit, whatever it was, and shut the game down and canceled the World Series. So the chances of getting back involved quickly were, were slim. But uh, again, somebody who I knew and somebody who I had helped and called me, Tony Siegel, uh, who had a long career, just retired from the Giants this past year. He's 80 years old. He's in the game probably 60 years. Um, he was leaving to go to Colorado, which was starting uh, its franchise maybe a year in. And um, he said, hey, I'm leaving the Giants, and they've asked me to help them find my replacement. I can think of nobody better than you. So lo and behold, I ended up working for the Giants. Ned, is it because you created great relationships? You treated everybody equally? You were very friendly with everybody? Is that why people love you like this? I mean, think about it. Not if a, a kid wants to work for a baseball, you know, he has to create relationships, right? I mean. Well, there's there's no doubt your, your network helps. Um, I really had no network. And I had to develop a network. And while I talk a lot now, you know, I do shows like yours, I teach, TV. Um, when I was a kid, I, I rarely spoke up. I was quiet. I was probably insecure in my knowledge. I was probably... Uh, afraid to speak up because I thought I would probably be wrong in an educational setting. Um, and I had to get over that. I had to get that confidence and I had to, I had to develop relationships. And, you know, it's, um, it's easy today not to do that because of your cell phone and because of email and, tw and, and text messaging and social media. It's easy not to talk to people, but it's not better. Right. It's just easier. Yeah. And so I had to, I had to establish relationships. You know, when I went to San Francisco, Tony had left. 
and Bob Quinn was a general manager. I knew of Bob Quinn. I said hello to Bob Quinn. I'd never worked for Bob Quinn. Brian Sabian was the assistant general manager. Smart guy, Sabian. Sabian's a smart guy. Sabian's the best, boy. Oh, and, yeah. uh, but we didn't know each other. And so people had to trust each other and, and figure out that, hey, you know what? We can all figure this thing out together. And after a couple tough years in San Francisco with losing 90-some games in uh, 95 and 96, by the time we got to 97, in the front office had changed a little bit. Suddenly we started to put together some pretty good clubs. Yeah. And that led to a new, a new ballpark down at the Bay. You know, it's, it's park. beautiful. Park. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's 20 years old now. Yeah. But, you know, it, you know, Time goes so quick, but, you know, San Francisco was, in my opinion, was nowhere near the baseball city it is today. And a lot of good things happened, including the team got to be pretty good, pretty fun to watch. And he had a guy playing left field that was pretty dynamic in Barry and a guy at second base who's, in my opinion, a Hall of Famer in, in Jeff, in Jeff Kent. And, and one thing led to another, and the ballpark came out of the ground because the ownership financed it, built it. Next thing you know, you're you know you've got three plus million people coming to your games and you're going to the World Series four times in a, in a handful of years, winning three of them and oh yeah, doing some great great stuff. So you know, Ted, I I I always defend Barry Bonds and I had a great conversation with Barry Bonds. Check this out, Ned. We were at West LA Little League, right? Here's my story, of Barry Bonds. He thought I was a parent. I was wearing my Yankee jacket and he gave me an urban hug. And I told him, I was like, hey, listen, buddy, you know what? You look familiar. And he's like, oh, yeah? I'm like, yeah. I'm like, oh, wait a minute. You're that lefty from Arizona State, right? That's you, right? And then he just looks at me and he goes, you fucking New Yorkers know how to fuck with me, don't you? I'm like, oh, come on, Barry. That was a good one, wasn't it? He goes, yeah, come sit down. Let's talk. We talked <laughs> hitting for two hours. And I was like, I think people are saying that this guy is bad, this and that. And then I'm saying to myself, he was so charismatic with me. We had so much fun. And then, listen to this. It's better, Ned. The movie Million Dollar Arm, I get invited. I'm on the green carpet. And he sees, like, yo, Eddie Mata, what's up? I'm like, what? You remember me? He's like, oh, yeah, you gave me a class. You, you introduced yourself with a classic story. I was like, oh, my God. You know what I mean? So, but I then I found out. Getting all this information. By the way, I read your book, 455 pages this past weekend, all right? <laughs> so it was a lot of work I did. But I found out that when Barry Bonds, they said, listen, this is for a sick kid. Please sign the ball. He signed the ball, but it wasn't for a sick kid. It was going on sale somewhere. And that's when he lost his trust on people. But if you do trust him, he's, he's, he's got your back, right? Tell me a great story about Barry. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move here and try and get out of the wind a little bit, too, as I do this. Yeah, I was about to tell you, man. That wind is Candlestick Park right now. Yeah. Yeah, maybe this will be a little bit better with it. Yeah, that's good, yeah. Okay. I think Barry, um, Barry to me, is a sometimes misunderstood character. He, um, if he trusted you, he'd do anything for you. And I don't think he grew up uh, where he could trust a lot of different people. I think people would take advantage of him. I think people took advantage of his notoriety, of his stardom, uh, by asking for autographs and different things like that. And then uh, well, the reason that they, got, that they asked or that he signed didn't turn out to be the reason that they ended up doing what they did. And I think he, he you know, this is a guess. I think he, he, you know, he just found it easier to be isolated and to have a, a certain small group of people he could trust and trusting everybody and being disappointed. My first year in San Francisco, uh, I said hello to him four or five times. You know, he acted like I was invisible, you know. And um, I've been around great players. Maddox had been around for the beginning of career uh, through the end. Andre Dawson, Ryan Sandberg, Rick Cliff, Mark Grace, a lot of, a lot of great players. So it wasn't like, okay, you know, whatever. All we need this guy to do is play. I don't need to be his friend. I don't need to have a conversation with him. And about a year went by. And in Scottsdale Stadium the next spring, um, I'm walking through the clubhouse, and he calls my name out. And he goes, hey, man, you're kind of you're kind of standoffish, huh? I go, wait a minute. I said hello to you like five or six times last year, and you act like I'm invisible. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm short, but I'm not invisible. <laughs> you know? And uh, 
from that day on, it, it, it worked well. And he said, look, you ever need me to do anything, all you got to do is ask, man. But, you know, I don't want, you know, make it easy, make it turnkey. And I don't want anybody to know right. that I'm that I'm doing this stuff. And, you know, many times I would, I would get asked for charitable things, or, you know, help people out with different things. And I'd say, hey, B, you know, and he said, just tell me where and when. And he was great. He was uh, he was great. And then, um, you know, I came to L.A. I came to the rival and he was um, honored at the scouts dinner in, um, in Beverly Hills. And in, in the January, I had left the Giants for L.A. in November of 05. And in that January of 06, he was honored as the player of the year of foundation. And he saw him in the audience, and he kind of nodded. And as he got them accepting his award, he he said some really, really complimentary things about my work ethic and, and my knowledge uh, to the group. I was taken aback by his kindness. And, um, you know, he's uh, most of us have no idea what it's like to be a star, what it's like to be continually pounded and continually uh, dissected. You know, I think... Um, just another opinion, you know, people, if, if you have a favorite band or a favorite actress, actor, athlete, whoever, whoever you admire from afar, and you don't really know that person, your background on that person, your knowledge of that person really comes from the media. They kind of set the stage, good person, bad person, nice person, selfish person, whatever, you know, and that's, that's how it goes because you don't have, you don't have access to people. Yeah. And I think he never really wanted to embrace the press. He was never keen on talking to the media. Mm -hmm. I tell you a million stories of things that, that didn't turn out as, as the media had planned. And so I think that, you know, they helped, they helped build, build who he was. Yeah. And yeah, he could be like that. Certainly. But I've also seen a different side of him. I've seen a compassionate side. I've seen a real human side. And um, I got to the point my first year where, you know, he wouldn't even say hello or not or acknowledge to the end of my giant career. If I had to walk by his, he had a row of lockers, maybe three or four lockers that he used. If I had to walk by there and he was sitting there, I had to make sure I had time. Because there's a chance he was going to tell me to sit down and we were going to have a baseball discussion. Wow. And and that's, you know, smart guy. Boy, I tell you, the, the smartest hitter I was ever around on a daily basis was Barry. Genius at what he did. Oh, yeah. Pitcher, Greg Maddox, same thing. Zach Greinke, probably right behind Greg. Manny Ramirez. Yeah. Yeah. So, Eight or four in LA, probably right right behind Barry, as far as knowledge and photographic memory and the ability to execute and to to make things happen. He wasn't afraid to fail. He wasn't afraid no. to fail. And you know what? And before all the issues, all these accusations about him, I'll tell you right now, before two thousand, he put up Hall of Fame numbers. I mean, over four hundred home runs, four hundred stolen bases, four hundred doubles. That guy was off the hook. I mean, this guy was a pure hitter, and he was smart hitter because I remember uh, in the dugout, he says, all right, guys, I missed that pitch. Watch my next at bat. I dare him to throw that curveball slider because it's going to McCovey. It's going. <laughs> you know what I mean? No, he he had it. You're right. And, you know, he was destined for the Hall of Fame before any anything changed or accusations or whatever, you know. He was destined for it. He was um, – he started out as a center fielder for Pittsburgh. Okay, I saw I was in the National League East with the Cubs when he came to the league. So I saw him as a rookie. Then I saw him develop. And, you know, left field sometime is where he finished his career, where he played a lot for the Giants. Left field kind of gets, gets uh, excluded from conversations as to great defensive players. It's like a position you don't notice. Right. It's almost like a first baseman. You don't know a right. first baseman is good until you have a bad one. Yeah. Right? <laughs> and and I think the when I when I think about him playing left field, he was phenomenal. Mm -hmm. And his ability to read the ball off the bat, get a jump, and being left handed in left field has got some benefits to it, but also some difficulty to it. 
because a ball down the line, he's going to have to spin and throw. Right. He was excellent at it. And he knew how to play. He knew how to play. And plus, when, left, and plus when a left-handed hitter is up, it's really when you play left field and a left-handed hitter is up, you know, you have to read the ball because when you hit a shot to left field, you don't know if it's going to, you know, go towards the left or go to yeah. the right. You know what I mean? With the spin of the ball because, and, and you know, Barry, he, he read that well, man. He read – because, you know, some lefties, most of the time when they go opposite field, they slap. It kind of slaps kind of. Yes. You know, a true hitter like Griffey, Barry, when they hit to left center, it doesn't tell. It keeps going, right. you know. Right. So, but let me ask you this. Now, you get a phone call. You're with your wife. Jeff Kent calls you. All right. This is the end of the San Francisco years now. And you're like, what? Why is Jeff Kent calling me? So when he called you, he said, just call him back, right? You talked to him, and what did he tell you? Well, this was an amazing story. <laughs> I love Jeff Kent. But Jeff Kent and I probably hadn't spoken to each other for a year. And it was uh, my son's, our son's birthday, so I was back in Chicago. And um, as I told you, my son was part of the conversation earlier when he was born uh -huh. in Philly. Um, so now he's grown up, years have gone by, and so I come back to Chicago to see my family and to, to go to dinner with my son and you know, on his birthday weekend. And uh, I'm in the car, and uh, I get this, this phone call from Jeff. And, uh, you know, I didn't answer it in the car. I, you know, I, I let it go, and I was going to call him back when I got to the, the final destination. And so I'm thinking as I'm driving, well, this is kind of interesting. This guy may have pocket dialed me because I haven't seen him for over a year or so. He played the, went to Houston after the 02 season, played two years for the Astros. It's the end of 05. He's played one year in L.A. You know, I'd see him once in a while around a ballpark or cage or something and, and talk. And so I stopped the car and I dial him and I say, hey, Jeff, he goes, yeah, yeah, I'm glad you called. And he says, uh, what's up? And he says, um, uh, I think the Dodgers might be looking for a new GM. And um, I've given them your name. Are you interested? And I said, well, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> L.A. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, well, but, but did, you, did you have a rivalry? Like, oh, shit, Dodgers, San Fran, rivalry. Oh, my God. You know? Luckily, I mean, a lot of the fan bases on both sides did. They, you know, the Dodger fans couldn't understand why they couldn't find somebody who didn't work for the Giants. Mm -hmm. And the Dodger fans said, well, was this guy a traitor, you know? Right. But I didn't grow up in either city. I grew up in Chicago. So you were a Cardinal yeah. hater. A Cardinal hater forever. Right. But, uh, you know, again, there's so many jobs like this. Right. And you're talking about an iconic franchise, okay. one that stands for social justice and, and, and so many good parts of it. And I'm in no hurry to leave San Francisco. I had a couple other feelers earlier in my career from other National League clubs that um, didn't really excite me, even though they were the GM jobs. Those franchises I thought were trying 81 games. You know, not my fatigue, just to be average. 90 up, baby. 90 and up. <laughs> and, um, and so I said, yeah, have, uh, have uh, Frank ask permission and call me in a few days. And nope. my contract wouldn't let me speak to anybody until after November 1st. Mm -hmm. So I said, I haven't called me at the end of the week, you know, and the next week because we we're right at the, right near the end of October. Ned, and, yeah. when, when uh, you got, when you had the meeting with McCourt, this was crazy. First of all, it was brutal. I felt like when I read your book, he was like Horatio from CSI Miami investigating you every bone and muscle in and your mind as far as becoming a GM of the Dodgers. And on top of that, the best thing about it, you guys were at the Beverly Hills Hotel and um, the guy that works at the Beverly Hills Hotel, he's like, huh, Swing 117. And you're like, yeah, well, what's that all about? Well, do you realize this is where the Rat Pack stays when they come in town? And, and, and you're like, oh, okay. And you're a huge fan of Frank Sinatra. But tell me about McCourt. I mean, was he like really investigating you? He, um, very smart guy uh -huh. and, um, tireless, 
relentless. And I had met with them um, on, on a Friday, uh, probably about the 10th of November, 9th through 10th of November and, uh, in 05 at the Beverly Hills Hotel. It's been about uh, six, seven hours with them. Flew back to San Francisco and um, called Peter McGowan, who was our managing general partner and uh, my ultimate boss there. And um, Peter had to get permission for me to go to LA to at least talk. And um, I hadn't heard from Frank for a couple of days and I called Peter just to have a conversation for him. Because Eddie, when you leave looking for another, you're not given notice. You're not two weeks notice or something like that. You know, one minute you're a giant, the next minute you're a Dodger. I mean, it's that quick. Mm. So I just wanted to talk to Peter, not knowing how things would go, but we owed each other a conversation. Uh, you know, he, he helped make that team stay, helped build the ballpark, probably the most influential person in the city to keep it, to make that ballpark a reality. And um, had done so many good things for the city and for myself and my family. I just owed him a conversation, no matter how the thing in L.A. went. So we met at about 5, 6 in the morning for about an hour. I talked to Larry Bear, who was a president of the club, and another dear friend that we've been through a lot of a lot of uh, growing with the team. By the way, Ned, let me cut you off a little bit. I, I text Larry Bear, and he big leagued me. He didn't text me back. I said, hey, give me a classic story about Ned. He didn't text me back, but go, go ahead. And, uh, and then I talked to, to Brian Sabin, of course. You know, we're very tight. And um, and then Frank called back and said, hey, I want you to come down for uh, another interview. And back then, he had a 72-hour window. You had to hire somebody within 72 hours of giving permission. Mm -hmm. And this was about 9 in the morning on Monday. And at noon on Monday, my 72 hours was running out. So Frank had to call Peter for more permission time and, and that. And so then I flew to L.A. and I got picked up and I went over to the Beverly Hills Hotel. It's probably one o'clock in the afternoon. And uh, Eddie, it was on. It was on. It was, it was like a heavyweight fight. Yeah. Nonstop. Um, I brought, I didn't have a, I didn't, I owned one suit. I had a couple sport coats. Uh, San Francisco weather always kind of conducive to a leather jacket at night. Mm hmm so I wasn't, uh, I wasn't uh, wardrobe up as like a Jerry Hairspray. Right. <laughs> you know? And um, so I got a sport coat on and a sweater, nice slacks and cowboy boots, which I wear all the time, and uh, except during pandemics. And um, there I got a suit and a bag and uh, go down there and we start. And uh, I'm sweating. I mean, it's hot in this room. It's middle of November, but it's middle of November, but it's still hot. And um, I haven't eaten breakfast. I had the Peter McGowan meeting. Hadn't eaten since really maybe four or five o'clock the night before. And get a little hungry and um, hot. And uh, and Frank just keeps going and going and going. And it's like boom, I, boom, boom, right? <laughs> Oh, yeah. On, on, you name it, every topic under the sun. So um, it's about 10 o'clock at night, and uh, Jamie McCourt, his then wife, comes by and I just say, would you like to get dinner at the, at the Polo Lounge? I said, yeah, absolutely. So we go there, and now Jamie has a million questions, too. So I really don't have a chance to eat dinner. And I got both the, I got Frank on the side, Jamie on the other side both really smart people and they're, they're really, you know, it's, it's like a heavyweight fight. Oh yeah. This goes on till about one in the morning. Jamie leaves. We go back to the suite at midnight and 11 o'clock and Frank and I continue to discuss. And now it's about one in the morning. Frank says, uh, all right, I got till when I says, you got till noon tomorrow. You got till 12 o'clock. Um, and we're not going to get a minute after that. Peter will not give us another minute. So you got till noon. And so he says, okay, I'll meet you back here at 6. I said, all right. He says, let's go. I said, oh, you got a little wind there. Hold on, though. Don't go anywhere. Hold on. All right, continue. Let's go. Go ahead. Where am I going? And he says, well, you're not staying here. I said, what do you mean I'm not staying here? This, it's common custom. You know, it's customary if you're going to interview for a job and stay overnight. The people doing the interviewing are going to 
are going to put you in a you know a hotel, right? Yeah. And, uh, he said, well, I didn't plan on that. And I said, so what am I supposed to do? Go hail a cab now on Sunset Boulevard at, the, at <laughs> one in the morning? Is the take there? Care. I have a hotel room. Where am I going? And so we're standing out of out of one, the suite 117, and you know we, we're getting animated about where I'm staying. And uh, he finally acquiesced and let me lets me stay there. So I sleep a couple hours. I'm all geared up. It's like I mean, it's a big day for me. It's like the seventh day of the game of the World Series for my career. Yeah. And I don't sleep much. And about 5:50, he's knocking on the door. He comes in. He says, would you like, uh, want to order some room service or something? I said, yeah, I'll have a bagel and a hot tea. So guy shows up with the bagel and the hot tea and whatever, Frank. And he looks at me and he says, so uh, you stayed in this room last night? I says, yeah. He goes, this is my favorite room in the hotel. It was a three-room suite. Far end was a beautiful master bedroom. Middle room was a, had a piano, a bar. And then he had the first room, which was a little conference table, like a meeting area. So this is my favorite room. I said, really? He goes, I've been here a long time. He goes, you ever heard of the Rat Pack? I says, well, yeah. I mean, I'm a huge fan of the Rat Pack. Sammy Davis and Frank and Peter Lofford, Joey Bishop. And he goes, well, when they would come to party in, in Beverly Hills, this was the suite they would get. And they'd, they'd hang there all the time. And uh, weekends, big weekends, and they took great care of me. They tipped me up well. They were always kind to me, courteous to me. And so, uh, you know, you, you got to sleep in the room that, that hung on. You know, the whole room is different. He says, the piano is the same piano, the bar is the same bar, but everything else has been changed out. It's been a while. So I think that's pretty cool. So anyway, so Frank and I continue this, this conversation, and at about 11.15, 11.20, he offers me the job. And, um, you know, for short money, you know, it doesn't. I know what my predecessor had made. And I, but you declined, I Ned. You declined that first offer. I turned him down. I said, you know what? You've got the wrong guy. I know what's ahead of me, and uh, I'm honored. Don't get me wrong. A guy who grew up in a garage that gets to sit here today and have this kind of conversation doesn't happen often. But uh, you got the wrong guy. So we negotiated. And he, Frank is the best one-on-one -on -one negotiator I've ever been around. And uh, it was not easy. But I also knew, and I teach this at Pepperdine too, you know, to know your environment and know where you're at and be able to slow your mind down. I knew this. I knew it was the 15th of November. I knew that the, the Dodgers had six weeks since their season ended. I knew that they had a 71 and 91 record when that season ended. I knew it was the second worst record in the history of the LA part of the franchise. I knew that he called me back for a second interview. I knew that he had just spent a Friday with me for about eight hours and about 12 hours on Monday and another four or five here on Tuesday. And I knew that he was running out of time. And I knew that the team didn't have a manager, didn't have a coaching staff. I'm thinking all of this like within about six seconds, right? Mm -hmm. Slow your mind down. Make sure you understand where you're a huge part of negotiation. And then I said, I'm honored. But you got the wrong guy. And he says, what do you need? And I laid out what I needed. And um, he said, okay, um, as long as you give me an option on a fifth year. And I said, well, I'll give you an option on a fifth year if you'll give me the option on a fifth year. Because maybe after four years, maybe we both need to make a decision. And it kind of caught him by surprise, I guess, a little bit. And he agreed to it. And as it turned out, it was a huge move for me because it was right during a very perilous time in the ownership's cycle. And they, uh, you know, had I not had that opportunity to renegotiate a deal after four years, because I would have opted out if we had won the, won the playoffs in, that, in my first year in 06, took 71 and 91 and went to 88 and 74 and, and played the Mets in the first round and got beat, but still, still got there. And then um, didn't have the same kind of success in 07. And in 08 and 09, we went to the LCS against the Phillies. Yeah. So that's that was the backdrop of where I was coming out of. Mm -hmm. and, um, and he said, I have great news for you. I'm going to pick up your option. I says, I have even better news for me. I'm going to decline. You know. And so that set forth a longer-term deal, which which got me through the, the difficult time that everybody was going through. But the kicker to the story is um, years go by, a decade goes by. And I do a lot of charity things in L.A., and I'm at a, a banquet for a place called Home, which is one of my 
places I really have an affinity for. Great place for for young people in South Central LA. And I'm at this this uh, reception for this big awards night, and um, I don't really know anybody. I'm standing by myself, and uh, you know they're coming around with the champagne on the on the, on the little trays and this and that. And this guy comes and he's making a beeline towards me, and he says, uh, "Mr. Coletti," I says, "Yeah." He says, um, "I says." No, thank you. I says, I says, no, no, that's okay with the champagne. He says, I have to say something. I said, what's that? He said, I appreciate everything you did here as a gem at the Dodgers. I said, thank you. And he said, uh, one other thing. I said, what's that? He goes, November 15th, 2005, Rat Pack Suite, big hot tea. I'm the guy that brought it to you. Oh, wow. Crazy. True story. Absolute true story. Ned, what but, about the Frank Sinatra story about, I think it was you and Billy Connors. Yeah. I went to meet him at a restaurant. and Well, here's the deal. Here's the story. Good. Um, my good friend is Tom Dreesen. Tom Dreesen uh, opened for Sammy Davis Jr. for three years and then for another 12, 13 years for Frank. And Tom was a huge Cubs fan. He was a huge Cubs fan. Mm -hmm. And would always call me for tickets. So I'm in San Francisco, and it's a Thursday in May of 1992, and we're off that day. And my hotel room phone rings. I think this is before cell phones. And it's Tom. And he says, hey, I want to return a favor for you. Barbara Sinatra is not We're playing down at the Circle Star Theater in Redwood City. I had no idea where that was. I'm from Chicago. I'm working for the cup. I had no idea where. I ended up living 15 minutes from there. Oh. Years later. And he says, uh, uh, I have these two tickets. Barbara Sinatra is not, not going to make it. Um, so Frank said, give them to a friend so I could think of nobody better than you and you can bring whoever you want. So that's really cool. So I called Billy. Billy's excited. And um, we meet at the, uh, at the hotel where Frank was staying and, and where Tom was staying. And we, um, we get in limo with, with Tom and, and we drive down to the, the concert. And as uh, one thing leads to another, um, I hear I hear uh, bustling in the little dressing room next to me. And I look at Dries and I said, is that Frank? And he goes, yeah. I said, I'm going to go say hello. And he goes, can't do it. He's not that kind of guy. I said, all right, all right. So then the concert goes. Now we're sitting in limos and we're going to go back to the city. I'm sitting in the back. Billy Connors is to my right. Tom is facing me, sitting in the seat that, is, that has the back to the driver. Within 10 feet from me to the left is Frank Sinatra getting into a limo. I go, I'm saying hello. And I go to get up, and Dreesen leans across, and he grabs me back by the seat of my pants. He goes, you can't do this. You can't do this. He's not that kind of guy. We're trying to get out of here before the crowd. All right. So now we're driving up 101. Again, I had driven up 101 rarely, just coming and going from the airport. I would end up driving up 101 for 11 years, mm -hmm. going to Camp Stick Park and then Pac Bell and then AT&T. And we're driving up there, and he goes, so now you're mad at me, huh? And I said, well, Tom, I said, how many chances am I going to get to meet Frank Sinatra? And you're his good friend, right? He goes, yeah, we're friends. I says, where do you spend Christmas? He goes, Frank's house. I go, New Year's? Frank's house. Summer holidays, Memorial Day, Fourth of July, Frank's house. Wow. I said, you ever, you know, you stay there for parties? And, yeah. I says, so you're more than a passing friend. You're a good friend. He says, yeah, we're great friends. I says, so you can't introduce <laughs> two guys that are great friends of you to one of the greatest singers of all time. And, and we're all Italian, you know, I mean, even, even more so, you know. And he goes, well, you know, he's not there. I says, I don't want to hear about it. Tom, I've done so many things for you. He was a bat boy once at 40 years old. I got him to be a bat boy at Dodger Stadium for his cubbies. Wow. You know, all I could do. So we go to, they go to this restaurant, drop us off. And he says, I tell you what, come on into the foyer. And if he's in a good mood, he's in a good mood, you come in, you say hello, and off you go. I said, you got it. So Billy and I are standing in the foyer. There's nobody in the restaurant. They close it down, a place called Tommy Toys. It just closed for good a couple of years ago, right next to the Transamerica building in San Fran. And uh, he goes, come on back. He's in a good mood. So we're in the back room, and 
the owner, the maitre d', the chef are ahead of us, and then it gets to us, and he's, these are my two good friends from the Chicago Cubs, uh, Ned Coletti and Billy Connors. And we shake his hand, we, we thank him, I thank him for the music, and you know, what, what a thrill it was, and, and all of that. And so we're walking out of the back room, and this voice goes, where are you guys going? And I turn around, and it's Frank, and he's talking to us. And I go, oh, Mr. Sinatra, we're just going back to the team hotel. You know, we didn't, we don't want to infringe on your dinner. Saw the show. We we love the music. You're, you know, obviously a a person that has got you know such a history and a stardom and a you know for an Italian, it's it's pretty special. And he says, uh, you're not going to have dinner with us. I says, no. And so he says, uh, you're going to insult me and not have dinner with us. Wow. I said, Mr. Sinatra, we would never insult you. He goes and sit down. Oh, and I, look at, I look at Tom Vries and like, really? Okay, buddy. Thanks. Wow. So we spent three hours having dinner with Frank, and it was great. You it know, was one of the greatest. Uh, and what amazing. did you what did you confess to Tommy Lasorda about Frank Sinatra? What kind of fan is he really? You know what I mean? When you tell when you tell Lasorda this story and you say, "Hey, I got I got to confess something to you, Tommy." Here it is. Go ahead, tell me that one. All right. Well, this, this is a problem. I'm running out of battery on my my uh, my uh, Skype here, so this may have to be the last one, but it'll be a good one, I promise. All right, go ahead. So years go by. Mm -hmm. This is 1992. I meet Frank. Frank tells me at dinner. He says, "I said, well, I know you're great friends with Tom Sorter, right?" He goes, "Oh yeah, Tommy and I are like brothers. We're really close, um, and we're you know we're dining and stuff." And a couple minutes go by. He goes, "You know that?" He goes. As much as I love Tommy, I grew up a Giants fan. I said, really? He goes, well, you know where Hoboken, New Jersey is? I said, yeah. And he says, well, right across the river was the polo grounds. That's yeah. what I could see from my street. He said, but I've never told Tommy that. And, you know, and, and I love Tommy. And I've been, you know, I have tickets at Dodger Stadium. And he's one of my dearest friends, you know. I said, oh, OK. So years go by now. It's 1998. It's six years later. Frank is deceased. And... Brian Sabian and I are now working together in San Francisco. And we had signed Oral Hershiser for that season, the 98 season. And it happens to be a weekend where Oral's going to pitch against his former team, the Dodgers. And Sabes and I go to the game, and we have no place to sit in the press box. It's just loaded with people because of the story of Hershiser pitching for the Giants against the hated Dodgers his team that he started with. So Bill DeLore, who was a traveling secretary for the Dodgers for a number of years, and was a dear friend, says, I know you guys don't have a place to sit, but I can. we have one place. Tommy's got room in his booth if you want to sit with Tommy. And I go, yeah, all right. And Sage goes, you don't want to sit with Tommy. How's this going to look? It's a nationally televised game. You know, the assistant GM, the GM, and the Dodgers, you know, the, you know, the guy that's iconic with the Dodgers all sitting together watching this game. Not a good look. I said, where are we going to sit? He goes, let's go back to the hotel. I says, we didn't come to go back to the hotel. Let's just sit with Tommy. So we sit with Tommy. I'm sitting between Sabian and Tommy. And it's uncomfortable because Sabian won't say nothing. Mm -hmm. And Tommy going on and on and on and I'm trying to, to manage my, my boss, my buddy, but my boss, mm -hmm. who's disappointed that I chose this, and, and Tommy. And so as time goes on, I don't know why I thought of it, but uh, you know, trying to pass the converse, make conversation, I guess. You know, Hershiser finishes an inning and walks off into the visiting dugout on the first base side. And I look at Tommy, I go, you know what I heard one time? He says, what's that? I said, I heard Frank Sinatra was a Giants fan. And Tommy goes, who told you that? I says, I got it on a pretty good source. And he goes, that's a lot of BS. No, it's impossible. You know, Frank and I were tight. Frank was always in my, my, my office. I got a million pictures together. We had dinner many times together. I'd see him in New York. I mean, we were like tight as could be. I says, well, I got it from a pretty good source. He grew up a Giants fan. And I leave it out there. And it goes quiet for about five minutes. And now Tommy stands up. And he goes, who told you that? I says, I can't tell you. And he goes, you're lying to me. I says, I'm not lying. And when I heard it, I didn't hear it when I was working for the Giants. I heard it when I was working for the Cubs. 
And he goes, that's a lot of BS. And now he's getting angry. Now he's getting angry. He's like pointing his finger in my chest. He says, tell me who told you. Tell me who told you that lie. And I said, if I tell you, I'll break your heart. So I'm not going to tell you. I'm sorry I even brought it up. And he's and he won't stop. He won't stop. Meanwhile, Saban's not saying a word. He hasn't said anything. <laughs> so I said, Tommy, I'll tell you. But I'm going to break your heart when I do. And he says, tell me, tell me. So I said, I had dinner with Frank Sinatra. And he told me that he loves you. He loved you like a brother. But he grew up in Hoboken, right across the river from the Polo Grounds. He couldn't help but be a giant fan. Tommy goes, you're kidding me. You get away from me. And he throws us out of the booth. <laughs> the booth and Saves and I are walking down the concourse. And Sabian looks at me. He says, you couldn't have told that story 45 minutes ago? <laughs> So that's my story. Ben, I know you got to go. I have so much more, but listen, I'll let you go. I, I know you got a schedule and stuff like that, but listen, it's such an honor talking to you. Seriously, I, I was fascinated by the way you grew up. It reminded me, it reminded me, it reminded of me how much of a diehard Yankee fan and how I was, you know, watching TV or listening to the radio, and I couldn't wait for this weekend baseball every weekend to come oh, yeah. on. Yeah. You know? So, you know, I grew up in the 80s, you know, I'm 44 now, but, you know, I know you got a little on me, but the fact how much you love the game, yeah. I don't really see that in our generation as far as kids are like, I'm sure when you grew up, you just didn't know the Cubs. You knew other teams, too. You, need, you, knew, you, roster, you knew everybody who played everywhere, yeah. you know. Things are different, but the game is still the game, and the game is the best. I want to thank you so much for having me on. I'll be happy to do it again with you, Eddie. Hopefully, I'll meet you out in L.A. sometime well, when the pandemic goes away. But Ned, I when, when, I, there. when I come to L.A., I expect gangster seats right behind home, you and I, all right? <laughs> we'll do our best. Listen, then I would love to interview again, but as far as when you, you know, with the signings and all that, you let me know when it's a good time to interview, like with the signings, you know, how you hired Joe Torrey, Mattingly, yeah. the league, and, you know, stuff like that. I would love to. You just let me know when you're free. I know I took a lot of your time, but I love you. You know what I'm saying? I love your biography, man. I was fascinated, all right? I appreciate, I appreciate it very much, Eddie. All the best. Be well, my friend. All right. Stay safe, all right? Thank yeah. you so much. Oh, and now, yeah. one more thing. Oh, I'm going to start right now. Hold on. Let me just finish.